Our Lord Jesus Christ taught a model prayer. He taught that prayer in Luke chapter 11 as we studied, and he taught that in Matthew chapter 6. He did not give us that prayer, that we would repeat that prayer, because to repeat it, as perhaps the Catholics do, that would be called vain repetition. God never meant for us to have a prayer that we write out and we repeat it to him over and over again, though it might be eloquent in its wording. God wants us to pray from the bottom of our heart. Amen? God wants to hear your heart. God wants to hear you pray. And the Bible says there, in the morning shall you hear my voice, O God, in the morning. But in this model prayer, he taught us to pray these elements. He said, Our Father, which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. We're looking this morning about the kingdom of Jesus Christ. I'm going to say some things about the kingdom. I'm going to tell us how we can be prepared for the kingdom. How the king, where is that kingdom? All of those things about that. Jesus in Luke chapter 17 gives us six essentials of discipleship. We saw two weeks ago that one of the essentials of discipleship is that we are to, uh, to be blameless in our life and to be a good testimony and not to cause other people to stumble in their faith. He taught us number two, that we should be forgiving individuals. We should be forgiving. Now, forgiveness is not something that's natural. Forgiveness is something that's supernatural. Forgiveness is something that God wants us to do repeatedly. And he speaks about the fact that he says offenses or, uh, or, or situations will come where someone will offend us, where someone might be a stumbling block to us. But he says if that person realizes they hurt us and they come to us with a heart of repentance and say, please forgive me, we're to forgive them. What makes it challenging is what if that person keeps on hurting you? What if that person keeps on saying the same thing? What if that person keeps on committing the same thing? And we, we just feel like, you know, I need to keep my distance from them. And yet that person comes back and repeats to us, I'm sorry, would you forgive me? Jesus said, that it's our duty to, re to repeatedly forgive them. Now, again, that might not seem natural, but it's supernatural. We're to be forgiving. And, of course, as the disciples saw that, that third requirement of discipleship was a prayer. We're to pray for more faith. The disciples realized it was very difficult for them uh, to live a good testimony. And the disciples realized that, uh, that it was very hard and difficult to be forgiving, especially as they were getting closer and nearer to the crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ. Those disciples were fighting among themselves and, and uh power, you know, there was power wrangling going on. They wanted to be next to Jesus and his kingdom there. And so Jesus, they realizing their, their, their shortfalls, they said, Lord, increase our faith. One of the things I want to challenge you about, which is part of our theme this year, and kind of dovetails into our theme for next year, is that we pray for God to increase our faith. We need more faith. We need greater faith. We need God to increase our faith or augment our faith. And then there was a fourth requirement of discipleship. He taught us that, uh, that sometimes we could be busy serving the Lord and doing things, and uh, because we are following others, that we are maybe asked to do things to stretch us beyond, perhaps greater in a greater way, or stretch us beyond our, sometimes we think, our capacity. And sometimes we might feel like we're unappreciated and unacknowledged, and yet our attitude should be, we are unprofitable or worthless servants. In other words, we should realize that we're not worthy to serve God. It's a privilege to serve the Lord, and we're not worthy to be servants of the living God, and it's just a privilege that God would ask us to do anything. And we should, our response should be, we are unprofitable servants. We have done that which is our duty to do. And then last week, we saw a fifth duty. We saw that there must be the duty of thankfulness. And of course, going right into Thanksgiving, we saw the importance of that. I hope this week you had a list, a list of things you're thankful for, a list of people you're thankful for. I hope that you're thankful that you have an appetite and that you have good health. I hope that you're thankful for your cognitive ability. I hope that you're thankful for your church. Amen. I hope you're thankful for the word of God. I hope you're thankful for living in this generation. hope you're thankful that you're alive. Amen? hope you're thankful that you're saved and going to heaven. I hope you're thankful for all those things and much more there. And so we see the spirit of thankfulness. In our passage this morning today, we see a sixth, duty, a sixth requirement of duty, a sixth duty we have that we must follow. And that one, that one duty we're going to see this morning is the duty of faithfulness. Jesus speaks about the kingdom of God, the kingdom that has come. And we're going to speak about that. But the importance here is that we must understand the importance of being faithful. Uh, I'll be referring to the kingdom of God in the days of the Son of Man, but let me just say this real quickly. The days of the Son of Man, he's referring to is the return of Jesus Christ. Now we have a generic phrase we call the second coming. The second coming of Christ is a generic phrase that encompasses two stages. Stage number one is what we know as the rapture. The rapture is when Christ descends from heaven and the dead in Christ, our family members, our brothers and sisters in Christ who predeceased us, they are saved, but they died in this life. 
Their bodies will be raised incorruptible. We'll come back tonight. I, I'm going to be preaching as part of the message about, about the glorification of the believer. I'm going to say some things perhaps many of you have never been taught before. That's from the Bible. You want to come and hear about that tonight. But he speaks about when Christ descends from heaven, there will be the shout and the voice of the archangel, and the trumpet will sound, and the dead in Christ shall be raised up. And at that same moment, we which are alive remain, the we being every born-again believer, everyone who's saved, we're going to be caught up in the clouds to be together forever with the Lord. Now, the Lord's going to snatch us out. The rapture is a word harpazo. It means to be, to be snatched out of this world. We'll be taken up. The Lord will snatch us or take us out of this world. We'll be taken out. That rapture is stage number one. Stage number two is called the return of Christ. The return of Christ is when he does come again, but this time he descends from heaven and we descend with him. The first time he comes for us, the second time he comes, we come with him. And when he comes, his feet will touch the earth. They'll land on the mountain. As he lands on the mountain, he'll establish his kingdom on earth there. Now that stage two, seven years before that, stage number two, right after the rapture, will be seven years known as the great tribulation. It's called the day of God's great wrath. That's the very last verse in Revelation 6. Revelation says it will be the day of God's great wrath. Now I'm going to say a couple things as we get into this. We understand that we are going through the rapture. God's people will not go through the tribulation. If you're saved today, thank God, God's not appointing us to wrath. Can I hear an amen to that? Amen? God's not appointing us to wrath. We're not going through that tribulation time. It's going to be an awful time. It'll be a time of great cataclysmic events. There will be natural disasters, unprecedented floods and earthquakes and uh, global heat. If you think we've had heat waves, there will be heat waves so bad during the tribulation time. People will gnash your teeth and angry, look up to God and say, God, when is this going to stop? There will be wars and skirmishes going on all the time. People dying. There will be famines. There will be great pestilences. There will be disease, wide, wide, uh, widespread disease everywhere awful time. One third of the world's population will die off during that tribulation time. Now during that time, the gospel will still be preached. Jewish people will get saved during that time. The Jewish people will awaken during that. By the way, we need to pray for Jewish people to get saved. Amen? Jewish people will be awakened and there'll be 144,000 that God will call to be great missionaries and they'll circle the earth and they'll preach the gospel and every nation, every country, every realm of people amazingly will hear the gospel in their own language and will trust Christ as their Savior. But those who trust Christ your Savior during that time, they'll go through a time of great, great uh, suffering and persecution. Many will be persecuted. Many will be put to death for their, for their faith there. But then Jesus will culminate that seven-year tribulation time. At a time unannounced, at the end of the seven years, he'll come and he'll establish his kingdom on earth. Now, what does that all mean? Well, number one, let us consider, first of all, the kingdom rule. The kingdom rule. Now, when we talk about a kingdom, we're talking about a potentate. We're talking about a king. We're talking about a ruler who rules over people. I read, read recently that there are 43 sovereign states in our world right now. Those 43 sovereign states means basically they are countries ruled by a monarch. Now, the United States is not a sovereign state, okay? Uh, we were talking about a, a state, a, a, a country, like, like let's say like, Mor uh, like uh, Mo uh, Morocco, which, which is ruled by a monarch. They're ruled by a monarch as head of state. Of those 43 uh, sovereign states, 13 are in Asia, 12 were in Europe, like, like Belgium, uh, 9 in the Americas, 6 in Oceania, and 3 in Africa. They're ruled by a king. Now, we thank God today as we think about the kingdom of God, there's only one king, and his name is Jesus Christ. Amen? Our potentate is Jesus Christ. He's the king over his kingdom. So every kingdom must have a potentate. Every kingdom has people that the potentate rules over. Those people in the kingdom of God are you and I. Those people are the people of God. Now, as we think about the kingdom of of God, I need to say a few things. The kingdom of God is referred to 111 times in the Gospels. Some of those times are repeated. We find that the same, uh, same idea is conveyed perhaps in Matthew, in Mark, Luke, and John. But it's referred to 111 times. If the kingdom of God is a spiritual kingdom. In other words, it's a spiritual kingdom. It's an invisible kingdom. At the same time, the kingdom of God will be a physical kingdom. We know that this literal kingdom of Jesus Christ, when he returns, when his feet are planted on the mountain, he will bring us 
usher in his kingdom on earth. It'll be a kingdom he rules on earth for 1,000 years. We'll be the people of that kingdom there. We know something else about this kingdom. The kingdom of God is, is one to be entered into. This morning, if you're watching by live stream or you're here in person and you're not born again, you're not saved, your greatest quest, your greatest desire should be today to enter the kingdom of God. And I'll tell you about how you can do that at the end of this message. But the, Jesus said, the kingdom of God is one that must be entered into. Now, everyone today that's saved, raise your hand. If you're saved and born again, you know Christ your Savior, raise your hand. You entered the kingdom of God and you trusted Jesus Christ as Savior. You're part of that kingdom. You're kingdom people. And so the Bible says this about you and I. In Psalms 110, verse 2, it says this, the Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Now, the rod of his strength is Jesus Christ himself. He said, rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. He said, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Now, all of Psalms 110 is speaking about Christ, who's the son of David, who's the Lord, who, sent unto, who, who the Lord himself sent unto Jesus, sit thou my right hand. It's speaking about the millennial kingdom of our Lord Jesus Christ, that he is the potentate and we are his people. And he says, thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. Now, God's saying there during the day when, when Christ establishes his kingdom on earth, his people will be willing to serve him. Even today, as we think about the spiritual kingdom that we're all part of, we are willing to follow our Lord. That's part of discipleship. We acknowledge Jesus Christ as our king and as our ruler. 1 Peter chapter 2 tells us something else. If you have your Bibles, look at that. 1 Peter 2, verses 9 and 10. He says this about the people that are part of this kingdom. Ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who has called out of darkness into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but now are the people of God, which have not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. You know what's unique about us? We have received the mercies of God when we got saved. Amen. Thank God for his mercies today. Thank God for his saving mercies. Somebody help me today. Thank God for his forgiving mercies this morning. Thank God he gives us physical mercy. Thank God he gives healing mercy. But thank God today we have received mercy, the mercies of his forgiveness. How many of thankful this morning for God's mercies. Amen. They're new every morning. The Bible says great is the faithfulness of God. So there must be a people. There must be a potentate. There must be a place. Now where is the kingdom of God? Well look with me in, in Luke chapter 17. Christ answered that as he's addressing the Pharisees. He said, neither, verse 21, shall they say, lo here or lo there, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. Now right now, the kingdom of God is spiritual in nature. Where is that kingdom? Right here. When you trusted Jesus Christ as Savior, guess who came into your heart? Jesus. Amen. Jesus lives in your heart. And thank God Jesus is in your heart. And because Jesus is in your heart, you can, you can acknowledge it. The kingdom of God is within you. Now, the kingdom of God is most manifest when you acknowledge your life. Jesus is Lord of your life. My question for you, is he king of your life? Does he have absolute rule? Does he sit on the throne of your heart? Does he have the key to every room in your life? Does he have full access to everything? Oh, listen, we should not struggle with that. We ought to realize that, that he, the Bible says in 2 Corinthians 5.15, and that he died for all that they which live should henceforth not live unto themselves, but unto him which died for them and rose again from the dead. Listen, because Jesus died for your sins and mine, we ought to acknowledge him today as our king and our Lord, that he lives in our heart. Oh, this morning we see the kingdom rule. But secondly, what you notice in this passage of scripture, number two, what you notice, the king kingdom rumors. Now, Jesus has been speaking to his disciples. Here at this passage of scripture, he pivots and he's addressing now the Pharisees again. Now, the disciples are still there because the Pharisees are frustrated. They've been trying to entrap him. He has torn apart the veil of their hypocrisy. He's revealed that they're fakes. He said, you know, you wear your phylacteries and your robes and, and you put on your false religion and you've created this, um, these rules and standards which you've elevated by, above the word of God. And he says, I want you to know that I am the word of God and I stand among you and your rules and standards are not greater than the word of God, amen. God's word is the final say. God's word, in fact, as Baptists, we understand that God's word is the final and absolute authority of the life of every believer, amen? amen. 
Now, thank God there are commentaries and thank God for Christian books, but the commentaries in Christian books and the sayings of all, 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 every man that's out there is not the final say. The word of God is the final say for our life, amen? And so these the Pharisees, you know, they're somewhat frustrated and, and yet they're putting on a show and they're putting on a face. And the Bible says here in verses 20, 21, they demanded of him. Now, you don't demand anything of God, amen? You don't demand anything of Jesus Christ. He's king and he's ruler, amen? But they did not respect him and they did not receive his Messiah. So the Bible says they demanded of him when the kingdom of God should come. They were so blind. When is the kingdom of God coming, Jesus? And he had to give them some instruction. Notice verses 20, 21, and 22. He said in verse 20, The kingdom of God cometh not with observation, neither shall they say, Lo here or lo there. For behold, the kingdom of God is within you. They were looking for a physical, literal kingdom that uh, for signs it would manifest itself, that the kingdom was coming so they could anticipate that coming kingdom. Because you know what the Pharisees were looking for and the average Jew was looking for? They were looking for a political rule. They were looking for a political, military leader. They were looking, hoping that Jesus was that political, military leader that perhaps in fulfilling Daniel chapter 2 that would overthrow the Roman government, the Roman Empire. They were hoping that he would overthrow them, establish them as the people of God. They were hoping that he would rule over them. They were thinking Christ would come in great glory on his, on his white horse. And one day he will, but not according to their standard, not according to what they want. He will, according to Revelation 19. He will descend from heaven on a white horse, and on that horse will be written, on his vesture, faithful and true, but he's coming to establish his kingdom on earth, not his kingdom over just one group of people there. He said, you're looking for a kingdom that you can see, a kingdom with observation, that there's signs and details with that, that you can see, that, that you can inspect and look at and say, well, oh, this is my part in the kingdom because everyone in their minds are thinking, well, I'm such a self-righteous person that I'm going to rule over a city, I'm going to rule over a place, and that's not exactly what Christ had in mind. So leading to that, he says, if you're looking for that kind of kingdom, you're very susceptible to listening to rumors. The rumors would be this, that some perhaps enigmatic personality, some charismatic personality, some man or woman who's very eloquent in speech, Someone who'd rise up, what we would call a false teacher, but would try to establish themselves as being a spokesman on behalf of the people, might say, well, listen, we look at the prophetic signs like some are doing right now. Some are looking at everything going on in Israel and the Palestinian situation and other parts of the world. They say, oh, we're getting close to the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. And, and listen, you look at right now, prophecies being fulfilled. And I would agree with that, except for one thing. There are some looking at that, and they're on the television, and they're on the radio, and they're on the, they're on the internet, and they're writing books and they're establishing themselves as prophetic, if you would, prophetic gurus or prophetic experts and they're setting times and dates and places. I remind you today, listen, no man, no woman can set a time or place when Jesus is coming and when the kingdom will establish itself. We must understand that false teachers will come and they'll give rumors and Jesus said this, they're going to they're say, lo here or lo there, there's the kingdom. Look at verse 22. He turns to his disciples because he knew his disciples would be susceptible to listening to these Pharisees or others who'd rise up. He said, the days will come when you shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man and you shall not see it. He said, deep in your heart, you're looking for that kingdom, but in your mind, you're thinking of a political kingdom. You're thinking thinking of of a militant kingdom. He says, the day will arise when you desire to see one of those days. And as you desire that, you're just, you're just so overwhelmed with what's going on in our world. I mean, think about our world right now. We live in a world of violence. We live in a world of mixed up values. We live in a world of going far away from God. I mean, you can compare the world we live in today to the world that we lived in 30 years ago and even our forefathers maybe 50, 60, 70 years ago. You look at the world, it's, it's night and day, the kind of world we live in. It's not a safe place to live. The values of the world are all messed up. People are chasing after other things. There's less, there's less of a desire for God. The number of the fastest growing religion in the world is called the nuns, a people who do not identify with any faith. They have no belief in God. We're living in a world where young people are growing up in homes where the name of God is only mentioned as a swear word or curse name. 
Young people grow up, children grow up, they do not know who God is. They go to school and God is ripped apart and they, they're just, they're promoted with evolution instead of creation. I want to tell you, in the beginning, God created the world, amen? The heavens declare the glory of God and the firmament showed this handiwork. I remind you this morning, by faith we believe that the world were framed by the word of God so that things which are seen were not made by things which appear. I remind you today, the truth is that creation is the way that God brought us into the world and not by evolution. But we live in a mixed up world that has all these values. And so the people of God who have revealed truth, they have the word of God. By the way, the Bible is revealed truth. The Bible is absolute. The Bible does not change. It's unchangeable. Heaven and earth shall pass away, God Jesus said, but my word shall never pass away. I want to just tell you this morning, maybe you're a new believer. You can bank on the word of God. You can trust God's word. It will not fail you. Thy word, O Lord, is forever settled in heaven. But there's such a longing, and because of ignorance and because of lack of understanding the scriptures, some will say, well, lo, he's here, and lo, he's there. Look at verse 22. The days will come. You shall not see it. And they, these false teachers, they will say to you, see here or see there. These false teachers said dates and times. The coming of Jesus Christ. They'll establish himself as a leader of a movement. In some extreme situations, they'll lead the people of that movement to sell all their goods and sell everything away and put on sackcloth. There's one Taiwanese leader did that many years ago. And they'll lead these people out to the outskirts of a forest somewhere, the outskirts of a mountainous area, a terrain, an area that's uninhabited. And they'll tell their people, listen, you're just going to make a campfire here and we're going to put up a tent at night and we're just going to wait here till Jesus comes. And listen, they were disappointed because when he set that date and time or she set that date and time, Jesus did not come because he said, they're going to tell you low here and low there. He says, listen not to them, follow them not. He said in verse 22, he said, for they shall say, see here or see there, go not after nor follow them. He's saying here, be careful of, the, of these rumors, these kingdom rumors. Because when Jesus comes, his coming will be sovereign. Amen. He's going to come, the Bible says, and establish himself that he is the Son of God. His coming will be sovereign. He says he's not going to come with these little signs, these little men here, these little women here saying he will come in glory. Everyone will know that he's come. His coming will be sovereign. Hey, listen, his coming will be sudden. Look at verse 24. For the lightning that lighteth out of the one part under heaven shineth unto the other part under heaven, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. He's saying, listen, that seven-year tribulation period of time will come. There will be great natural catastrophes. There will be earthquakes. There will be tsunamis. Listen, there will be, there will be, there will be mudslides. There will be, there will be, there will be floods. There will be fires. There, you know, we're, we're just getting a foretaste of that these days. And everyone's thing was, blame it on global warming and blame it on this. Listen, the day will come when the global warming they think is happening today will be much, much worse during that time. There will be wars going on. There will be skirmishes going on. People will be dying. There will be, uh, there will be, there will be pests pestilences and plagues going on. I mean, it's going to be an awful, awful time in the world, these things going on, and somehow people will, will, spare, will be spared and not, and they'll make their way through some of that to the very end before Jesus comes. And he said, but some will be telling you, here's what's going on. Look, don't, he says, don't look, don't trust their word there. Don't look there, just trust the word of God. He said, well, how do you know Jesus is coming? Jesus is coming suddenly. Right. Like lightning that flashes from one end of the heaven to the other. We can hear the rumblings of the thunder, but we don't know when the lightning is going to flash. He says, the coming of our Lord will be sovereign. He will establish every, listen, when we, when we are raptured, the only people who are going to see him are going to be you and me. We shall see him as he is, the Bible says. We come back tonight, I'll talk about that. We will see him, believers will see him, the world will not see him. But according to Revelation 1-7, when he returns, remember there's a rapture and the return. When he returns, every eye on earth will see him and even them who pierced him, they pierced his hands and feet and they, they will all weep. They'll cry when they see him. The world will see Christ and when they see Christ, these unbelievers, they're going to weep and cry because they realize judgment is coming. This coming will be sudden. Like a flash of light. And the Bible says the thief, the Lord's coming will be like a thief in the night. His coming will be sudden. His coming will be sovereign. But notice verse 25. Because they were so caught up about the kingdom coming. 
They were so caught about the second coming. Christ had to bring them back why he was there for the first time. Amen? His first coming. And he said, yes, my coming will be sovereign and my coming will be sudden. But listen, my coming, he said, will be preceded by my suffering. Notice in verse 25, he says this. He says, For the, but first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. I encourage you to be students and well-read and well-knowledgeable about the sequence of events, about prophecy. But if all you do is study prophecy and do nothing for the Lord, you miss the bigger picture. And I want to remind you this morning, as much as this message today is focused on the kingdom that has come, I remind you that Jesus already has come the first time. And Jesus came the first time for one specific reason. He came to give his life a ransom for many. He came to die for the sins of the world. He came to manifest himself as the love of God. But God commendeth his love towards us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Jesus' first coming 2,000 years ago, which is why as we enter the Christmas season and we're celebrating Christmas, we celebrate Christ came into this world by way of a virgin. And through that virgin, he had a sinless life. And through that sinless life, he came and he died for us. That's why Galatians 4, 4, Paul wrote this, that when the fullness of time was come, God sent forth his son, made of a woman, made under the law, to redeem them that were under the law. Galatians 1, 4 says, who gave himself for our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. Do you understand something this morning? We don't live in a good world. We're not in a utopia. We're living living in an evil world. If it was a present evil world during Paul's time, it's a present evil world during our time. It's a wicked world. It's a depraved world. It's an awful world. It's a world without God. But Jesus died for our sins. He died for every sin. He died for every sinner. He died for your sins past, present, and future. To that we can say glory to God. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Who died for our sins that he might deliver us from this present evil world according to the will of God and of God our Father. The first thing every sinner must recognize, according to Luke 17, verse 25, that first Jesus must come and suffer many things. He suffered to die for our sins. He didn't want those Pharisees to be so caught up worrying, thinking about the future kingdom that they didn't focus on the fact they needed to get saved because they needed the Lord. They needed to realize that Christ, that he's making his way to Jerusalem, that he would suffer many things and he would be punished for the sins of the world. I want you to know this morning, Christ died for your sins. And I want you to know that he died for your sins so that you can be saved and so you can go to heaven. Earlier this week, we had a, one of our church members was helping a family that's unsaved, and an elderly couple, and he called me up, and he said, Pastor, he said, I'm trying to help them understand how to get saved, and I'm, I'm just kind of coming short of what to say. Could you help them, help explain the gospel to this dear lady by the name of Deborah? And uh, we got on the phone, and I said, Deborah, I said, now, our, our church member here, he just wants you to know that God loves you, and he loves you, and he wants you to know that you can be saved and go to heaven. And I said, do you know what it means to be saved? She said, Pastor, she said, that's why he put me on the phone. I want to know what it means to be saved. And I said, do you know that Christ can forgive you all your sins? She said, I want to know how that can happen. And I explained the gospel to her, and listen, with then a few minutes after this woman, Deborah, she trusted Jesus Christ as her personal Savior. Yesterday, I was making my way. We had baptized Angelina yesterday, and I was making my way back to my office to go change uh, in, the, in the office restroom there. And one of, our, one of our club workers was sitting with a young lady about, I don't know, 12, 13 years of age. And she said, oh, Pastor, you came at the right time. She said, this young lady just trusted Jesus Christ as her Savior. I said, praise the Lord. I looked at the young lady. I said, ma'am, I said, uh, what did Jesus do for you? I said, what did you just do? She said, I prayed and asked Jesus to come to my heart. I said, what did Jesus do for you? She said, he took away my sins. I said, do you realize Jesus died for your sins? She said, yes, I do. Do you realize Jesus loved you? That's why he died for your sins? She said, yes, I do. Do you realize that without Jesus' death were your sin, that your sins cannot be paid for? She said, yes, I do. I said, why did you receive Jesus? She said, because I know Jesus is the only one that can save me, amen? who delivered us from all of our sins, that he might deliver us from this present evil world. This morning, Jesus died for you. If you're not saved today, I encourage you today to realize Christ died for you and invites you to open your heart and receive him as your savior. Oh, number one, we see the kingdom ruled. Number two, we see the kingdom rumors. Number three, would you notice the crux of our message? Notice the kingdom responsibility. Remember, Christ is speaking to his disciples and he's speaking to the Pharisees. As he speaks to them, he wanted to remind them of our responsibility. 
And he speaks about two historical times. The days of Noah, which were before the flood, and the days of Lot, which were after the flood. You read Genesis chapter 6, the days of Noah were days of great wickedness, great violence. It describes with such a sad day, the Bible says God repented in his heart that he made man. It was awful. And he describes those days as this. Look at verse 27 with me. They did eat. They drank. They married wives. They were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Is there anything wrong with eating? Is there anything wrong with Drinking. Is there anything wrong with getting married? Is anything wrong with giving my children a marriage? No, absolutely not. But the days that Noah lived in, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation. I want to tell you this morning, if you're saved, thank God you found grace in the eyes of the Lord. Amen. Noah got saved. Noah got called at the same time. The Bible tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And Noah stood up in the midst of a nation, a world. They say they estimated the population of the world at that time was over one billion people. Explosive growth. We have men living for extensively long periods of time. You read that in the genealogies that are listed there, beginning with Adam in Genesis 5 1 and getting all the way down to Noah. I mean, Noah himself lived for, he was about 565 years of age, I think, or something like that, by the time that God speaks to him here. Even Noah saw many of his ancestors before they died. But man's heart went far away from God. When it says they ate and drank, it's speaking about the fact that they overindulged. They lived for eating. Not only did they drink, they became drunken. They filled themselves with alcoholic beverages and they were drunken. They were banqueting. They were feasting. They lived a party life. You know what I'm talking about. They lived a party life. They, got, they were overindulging in things. When it says they were giving marriage, they married, they divorced, they remarried, they divorced, they remarried again. They remarried, they divorced, they remarried. They, get, they did that. They cohabitated. They lived with a person that was not their spouse. They had same sex, they had same sex uh, relationships that were going on. I mean, the world was upside down. The world was filled with violence. Basically, one word describes it, depraved. One word describes it, it was a lawless world. It was a world going, out of, going to chaos. Two things describe the world. Number one, the world, the people of that world lived in a Apostasy. They had revealed truth. Where did the revealed truth come from? From Noah? Noah preached his generation. Noah stood up as a man of God. He preached God's word. He was faithful. He did not change his message. In fact, we're told the Bible says while he was preaching, he was building the ark. The ark was a testimony for every message he preached. The ark was the backdrop. The ark was a background. The ark, if you would, was a picture. The ark was the sermon illustration that pointed everybody to the fact they needed to be saved. The ark was a picture of Jesus Christ. Christ. The ark was a picture that if you enter into the ark, you can be saved. The pitch that they covered every crack and crevice with, the pitch was a reddish brown tarish substance. The word pitch is where we get the same word atonement from. The word pitch is, a, is, if you would, a picture, a symbol of the shed blood of Jesus Christ. You can see this ark here as this ark is in the backdrop there as he's preaching about the ark and every man must enter into the ark. He was preaching about Christ dying on the cross for our sins and they could see the reddishness of this, of this pitch that, that, that covered every crevice and crack of of the woodmanship, the workmanship that went up there. They looked at that, and it was a reminder of the shed blood of Jesus Christ that he would shed for them. And he kept on preaching for 100 years. Nobody listened to them because they were departing from truth. People kept on living sinful lives. People kept on living for the world. People kept on going a different way. They were, they were living apostasy. But as we read about, they ate and they drank and they were married. They were given in marriage. They were married and given in marriage. These people not only lived lives that were living in apostasy, far from revealed truth. They departed from the truth. 
They were also living lives that were apathetic. They were, they were, they were living in apathy. Apostasy and apathy. The same two characteristics of our world today. That people are going farther away from the truth of God's word today. Listen, the fastest growing religion in the world today is the one called the nuns of those who do not claim any belief in God alone. It's a tragic thing as we're out so many going to a home and knocking on a door and we go to a family and we introduce the family to Jesus Christ and children ask the question, who is God and what is God and who is Jesus Christ? And we have to begin with Genesis to help them understand who God is. They don't have a Christ mindset. They don't have a biblical mindset. They don't have a biblical worldview of anything like that. And so there's this, there's this apostasy. And then on the other extreme, People are so used to preaching and they're so used to going to church and they're so used to God's word being open and they're so used to the preacher coming down and preaching against sin. And by the way, preaching should be against sin, amen? We should be against sin and we should be for God and preaching for holiness and preaching for God and being prepared for the kingdom of God comes, he says. And so there's this, this apathy. People are just getting used to it. They're getting used to it. You can imagine Noah got up every morning and he pre- read over his Bible and as he read over his Bible, he got up and God gave him a message and he started preaching his generation here's a generation going farther away from God and they just turned their deaf they turned a deaf ear to everything he said their hearts became hardened they were indifferent to everything was being said it's like you and I we can get used to preaching about prayer we can get used to preaching about reading our Bibles we can get used to preaching about living for God we can get used to preaching for serving God we can get used to preaching about Thanksgiving we can get used to preaching about worshiping God we can get used to preaching about winning souls we can get used to preaching about going on missions we can get used to do all the things that the Bible speaks about there of being forgiving and being faithful we can get so used to yeah, about preaching about faith that we just become indifferent to it. It doesn't bother us. It's like water in a duck's back. It just rolls right up. We're indifferent about the things of God. And so the people during Lot's day, they were apathetic and they were apostate. They were departed from the truth and they were indifferent. They got to the place, go on and preach, Noah. You're just a nut anyway, Noah. What is rain anyway? Who ever heard of a rain? Who ever heard of a flood? Who ever heard of all of those things? You're crazy, Noah. No, none of those things are going to happen. It's not going to happen. And they became indifferent. They turned a deaf ear. He said, he talked about the days of Noah. He talked about the days of Lot. Lot lived many days after Noah. Noah, listen, Lot and Noah were both believers. Noah was a believer who was close to God. Lot, on the other hand, was a believer who trusted Christ. But he came in to be a man with many possessions, a large herd of flocks, And he needed land. And his herdmen became at strife with Abraham's herdsmen over land. And he lifted up his eyes and he saw the well-watered plains of Sodom. Sodom was an infamous city. It was an unnatural city. It was an unholy city. Every kind of sin and beyond that was practiced in Sodom. You read, Revela- you read Romans chapter 1 about the sinfulness of man. All of that was evident in Sodom. Sodom was a place where men fulfilled their lusts and went after the cravings of their lusts. They were uninhibited in their lusts. But in spite of that, he looked at Sodom and he said, man, that's a great place. That's a place where I can raise my family comfortably. That's a place where I can, I can become rich financially. That's a place where I can graze my cattle and I can own some land. And I, he said, that's a place I can go. That's like some of God's people. Sometimes they get disillusioned by what's going on in California. Get, get disillusioned that we've got, a, we've got a progressive DA going a different direction. And they get disillusioned because of rampant crime that's running out of control. And they get disillusioned about this thing, that, and the other, about the school system. And so they look over here and they see the city over here in Texas. Or they see the city over here in Colorado. Or they see the city over here in Arkansas. And they say, well, maybe if I move over there, I can find a good school to put my kids in, and I can find a good church to be a part of there, and I can go there to get away from the crime and all these types of things. I understand that. I get that. I understand that. You want to, you want to separate yourself from those things. But, but there's a delusion we have that we think that we can, we can, we can get away and we'll get better. And Jalot had this delusion that worldly Christians have. He had this delusion, and it didn't matter how bad that city was. It didn't matter how wicked it was. It didn't matter what they practiced. It didn't matter what their habits were. It didn't matter what their sins were. I can move there, and it won't bother me. It did bother him. The Bible says that he was a a righteous man, and his soul was vexed with the unrighteous deeds of the people there of Sodom. I'm telling you something this morning, brother and sister Christ, please listen to me this morning. We live in a world, this present evil world, this world that the corruption that's in this world through us. God help our soul. We should not get used to the things going on in this world. God help our soul this morning. 
We should not get to the place where we become apathetic and different to all these types of things as to what's going to happen anyway. We should get, listen, there's a, there's a ballot measure that's going to be on the ballot this year, 2024. Changing the definition of marriage, extending it to say, including inclusive same-sex marriage. If you're a born-again believer, you know God's word. You need to take a stand and vote no on that ballot this coming year. You see, being harsh, no, we're trying to be biblical, what God says. The Bible describes the days of Lot. Notice in verse 28, likewise also it was in the days of Lot. They did eat and they drank and they bought and they sold, they planted, they, they built it. Just went on and did their business, they built their business. It could be so easy for us if we own a business, we could be building our business and just say, you know what, I'm not going to let those things bother me, I'm going to build my business. Well, that's true. But that's what they did in the days of Lot. And they bought and sold and they built and they planted. They kept on doing their things. And they're amassing their kingdom because they were building their kingdom on earth when we should be sending head to the kingdom which is in heaven. Amen. And just like they did during the days of Lot, there was apostasy and there was apathy. Just like they did in the days of Noah, they did in the days of Lot. Apostasy, there's a departure from truth. And apathy, there was an indifference to the truth. I think I said this earlier in the message, but I've had several of you in this service and the other service this last few weeks in private have said, Pastor, I feel like my life is on a spiritual decline. I don't feel excited. I don't feel motivated. I don't feel bothered. I want you to know that the spirit of this age wants you to be indifferent. The spirit of this age wants us to feel like, you know, just take care of me, myself, and I. Let's be rich and increased with goods and having need of nothing. Let's just take care of me, myself, and I. Let's just take care of my little family. Let's take care of my little world. We'll take care of that. It doesn't matter what happens to everybody else. Let it happen to them. It doesn't happen to me. Oh, listen, this morning, where there's a spirit of apathy, the spirit of apostasy. And so Jesus is saying, there's a kingdom responsibility. And what he's reinforcing to us here, he says, he speaks about the judgment of God that came when the flood came and the judgment of God upon Lot's day when fire and brimstone came. You know what he's saying there? He says, all these things going on, this apostasy and this apathy, does not go on unnoticed by God. God sees and God knows. God knows what's going on in our heart. So what do we do? What's our responsibility? Number one, we must realize our responsibilities to approach everything we do with a heart of fervency. God's people must be fervent. We must live with fervent lives. We must stay in God's word. It's like one preacher, a man went up to his preacher and he said, pastor, he says, uh, my Bible reading doesn't help me anymore. I feel it's boring. I don't feel like I'm, well, he says, how long should I read my Bible? And the wise preacher said, keep reading your Bible till your heart burns. Amen. When we see a notice or just notice that the fire starts to go out, we need to get on our knees and pray down the fire of God on our lives. Don't get used to the apostasy. Don't get used to the apathy around it. Don't quench the fire in the voice of the Holy Spirit. Be involved in reaching people. Be involved in praying for people. Let the fire of his word stir you up. Don't have less church. Have more church. Amen. Amen. That's why Peter, he was standing there, heard that later, years later, as he wrote about this, he speaks about prophecy in 2 Peter chapter 3. He tells him, 2 Peter 3, 1, he says, Beloved, he says, uh, this second epistle, beloved, I, write, I now write unto you, in both which I stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. Number one, we must live with fervency. Number two, we must live with faithfulness. You know what happens when your uh, apathy gets in? We don't care. We're not bothered. We're not concerned. It's not my problem. And so, you might find yourself straddling the fence. You can't decide whether God is God or Baal is God. You've got to choose you this day whom you're going to serve, amen? And he's telling us here, somebody else departs, Somebody else fails, we must stay faithful. Be faithful. Listen, just because everybody else divorces doesn't mean you should divorce your wife or your husband. Stay faithful in your marriage, amen? 
Just because some people might stop reading their Bible, you be faithful in reading your Bible. Just because some people stop going to church or they change church because they want a watered down church, they want less of a church, they want less of emphasis, you stay in church, amen? Just because some people don't believe in reaching people with the gospel of Jesus Christ, they think it's somebody else's business, or they decide they want to they want to go towards the they want to go towards the false doctrine of Calvinism and believe that if I'm a Calvinist and that relieves me of my obligation, I remind you this morning we must win souls. Jesus said, "Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men." Amen. Amen. Let's live in faithfulness. Look back at verse twenty-eight. You know what's problem with Lot? The problem with Lot was that Lot compromised. He compromised his biblical values. He compromised the convictions he once had. He compromised his family. He compromised his faith. He compromised. He basically went over to Sodom and shook hands with sin and shook hands with the devil. He said, you know, it's not going to bother. I think I can get past it. Listen, better people than you and I thought they could get past it. They failed every time. And he compromised because he started straddling the fence thinking that, you know what, I think the grass is greener on the other side. That's where we get that phrase from when he saw the well-watered plains of Sodom. We must live in faithfulness. Be faithful to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Be faithful to your marriage. Be faithful to your parents. Be faithful to one another. Be faithful to the church. But there's a third thing. He tells us we must live with fervency. He tells us we must live with faithfulness. But then he said, he said here, look at verse 30 and 31. He said, uh, he said uh, actually verse 29, but the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. Now remember, Jesus is not talking about the rapture. He's talking about his return. He's talking about that when Jesus comes and the armies of the world assemble in the valley of Megiddo to do battle with Christ because all of the unsaved in the world at that time will be frustrated with God. They'll be hateful of believers. They'll be hateful of God. They're going to say, then they're going to think with all their nuclear armaments, with all their weaponry they have, we can do battle. We can defeat Jesus. We're going to shoot our missiles up there. We're going to shoot our cruise missiles and everything else we got. We're going to shoot everything we can and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna knock him out of the sky and they don't realize when Jesus comes he doesn't even have to send an arrow he doesn't have to send a spear he just opens his mouth he, opens, he sends out the word of God and they're all slain you read Zechariah 14 it talks about when, when he speaks his word there will be great fire coming down and listen I, their, their, their eyeballs will burn out of their sockets They're going to be defeated. He says even so thus shall it be in the day when the son of man is revealed Remember, his coming will be sudden. And he says, in that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. So in other words, here's somebody materialistic and very attached to their career, to their job, to their business, to their money, to their wealth, to their 401k plan, to their real estate, to their securities, to everything they have in this life. And he pictures this man on his rooftop realizing that danger's coming. Oh, I better go back inside my house quickly and grab my belongings, my possessions, and escape. And Jesus said, let not that man come down. I want to encourage you this morning, don't come down. Go up. Don't come down from the standard of God's word. Don't come down from holiness. Don't come down from having a heart for the Lord. Go up, amen? amen. And then he said a second thing here. He said, uh, neither let him come down. And then he said, he, he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. So he has this agricultural mind of someone plowing the field. And he knows that the time is urgent and Christ is coming. And he's thinking, man, I got to... Go back and get my possessions before it comes. Listen, the greatest possession you and I have is Jesus Christ. Amen? The greatest possession you have is your salvation. Listen, you're not going to take the possessions of this world out with you. We brought nothing in this world. We'll take nothing out. Amen? The only thing going ahead is your, is your soul in Jesus Christ. He says, let him not turn back. And then he made a statement, which I want you to understand as he said this. Everyone in that audience understood what he was talking about because they knew the historical evidence. They knew the historical fact. And when it came out of the, word, the mouth of the Lord Jesus Christ, it struck fear in their hearts and riveted them. When he said, let not that man turn back, he said in the next verse, in verse 20, 32, remember Lot's wife. We're not even given a name for her. 
Lot's wife and Lot were reluctant to leave Sodom when God said, I'm going to bring judgment. Lot had no credibility with his family. His sons and their wives, his two of his son-in-laws, they said, nah, that's not going to happen, Lot. We're going to stay here in the city. And Lot and his wife, his two daughters, the angels of God which came to visit him, to visit him, to get him out, the Bible says they took them by the hands. Or you ought to be thankful to God sometimes when God takes you by the hand, amen? He took them by the hands to lead them out. And one of the words instructing, he says, now listen, I can't bring judgment on this city for its, for its wickedness until you come out of the city. And he says, you're going to have to be far out. He said, when you get out, it'll rain fire and brimstone. I'm going to burn up the city. He said, I'll just tell you one thing. Do not look back. Do not look back. Whatever you do, do not look back. And so you can see this foursome here. Here's Lot leading the way. Here's his wife right after him. Here's his two daughters after her. They're all walking their way. And all of a sudden you can hear this explosion going on. The city of Sodom. And you could hear the crackling of fire. And you could smell the burning of elements there. That's the burning and fire. And you could hear the sound because the Bible says it rained fire and brimstone. So there's this crackling and there's this burning and there's this smell. Everything's so with In fact, the smell was probably a sulfuric type of smell they, that they smelled there. And listen, it could be very enticing and turn back. But Lot remembered the word that the Lord said. He says, don't turn back. Lot's wife on the other hand. Lot's wife couldn't get her mind off the fact from the moment the, that, that God said they needed to leave. She couldn't, couldn't get her mind off the fact that her life was there in Sodom. That everything that she owned, everything that she loved was there in Sodom. She didn't care about the lifestyle. She didn't care about the sin. She didn't care about the wicked. She didn't care about all those things. All she cared about was her women's society. All she cared about was her worldly friends. All she cared about were the things she wanted to do and the things she possessed. She thought about her jewelry. She she thought about her gold. She thought about her lavish clothing. She thought about her status in society. She thought about all those fake friends that she had there in Sodom there. She thought about all those things. And she heard all those things. She couldn't help but be gripped with remorse. She thought, man, all that, I'm, I'm leaving all that behind. And she instead, her body was going forward, but her soul turned around. And she turned around and she looked. And as soon as she did, the Bible says she was turned into a pillar of salt. I want you to understand that when she made that turn, her body was going this direction, but her soul was still in that city. Her heart was still back in that city. She left her heart there. It's kind of like Frank Sinatra said, but he left his heart in San Francisco. She left her heart back there in Sodom because that's where she was. In spite of the fact God, God had to judge Sodom, she left her heart there. Her heart's desire, listen, your heart's desire shouldn't be Sodom. Your heart's desire should be the Savior, Amen. Pillar of salt means... She became calcified, petrified. She became like a solid piece of rock. She became a monument of someone who left their heart there when the heart should have been there. Can you imagine for the years to come, passerby walking that same pathway? There's Lot's wife. Standing there is a memorial of someone whose heart was there when it should have been there. We're to live with fervency. We're to live with faithfulness. Thirdly, we're to live with focus. Turn your eyes upon Jesus. Look full in his wonderful face. Her eyes were on the things of the world when her eyes should have been on Christ. I say this morning, look into Jesus, the author and finisher of your faith. We need to keep our eyes on Jesus. We need to keep our eyes focused on the Lord. Keep your eyes focused on the work. Lot's wife, she lost her life. Look what Jesus said about that. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. She wanted to save her worldly possessions. She lost everything. You're trying to save what you have here. You're not going to take any of this out. Listen, there's no U-Hauls going to heaven, amen? There's no rider trucks going to heaven. We, you brought nothing to this world. You take nothing out. Whosoever will save his life shall, shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life shall preserve it. Live your life for Christ. Because you're laying up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust cannot corrupt. Then he said this. I tell you, in that night, there should be two men in one bed. Now, what's he doing there? Well, Christ... Speaks us about the kingdom rule. He speaks to us about the kingdom rumors. He speaks about the kingdom responsibility. Quickly, there's a kingdom removal. Look what he says in verses 26 to 29. He talks about 
three different kinds of people. Two men sleeping in a bed, and he's not suggesting anything of homosexual activity of any kind there. He's just saying he was common to his father and son shared a bed, and sometimes you'd go to an inn and you'd share a bed with someone else. Just what they did there was nothing unnatural about that. Two men in a bed. Two women grinding. They're doing work. They're grinding, they're grinding you know, making, making flour. And two men in the field. He says, in that day, when Christ comes, when he returns, one to be taken, one is left. Now, many have read that and have thought the one taken is referring to a believer. That's not what he's saying there. He's not speaking about believers. He's speaking about judgment. The context here is the second coming of Christ, the return of Jesus Christ. You read over in Revelation 19, when Christ comes, we come with him. When he comes, he comes to do business on earth. He deals with all those, the, the goat nations, all those who are against him, all those who are fighting with him, and he'll deal with them. The one taken is speaking about they're going to be taken into judgment. They're taken into judgment. What kind of judgment? Well, they're going to be, they're going to be, they're going to be, they're going to be killed. I hate to say it that way, but they're going to be killed. They're going to be punished through, by, by death by our Lord at his coming. And their bodies will be strewn across the land. And the birds of prey, the vultures and the eagles, he talks about the last verse here, verse 37, the vultures and prey, the birds of prey will come down and consume their bodies. What about, what about their soul? Their soul goes to hell because they rejected Christ. They had their opportunity, they reject. And by the way, this morning you have your opportunity, don't reject Jesus Christ. They're slain. Their carcasses touch the ground. Birds of prey come from everywhere and feast on their bodies. Look at verse 37. They answered and said unto him, We're Lord. And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, their bodies will be strewn everywhere. Thither will the eagles be gathered together. You see, those who do not trust Christ before his return will be slain in body, their soul will go to hell. After the 1,000 year of Christ, their souls, as well as every unbeliever who died from the beginning of Adam and Eve, who died without being saved, the dead small and great, rich and poor, all of them will be raised to stand before the great white throne of God. And that great white throne, which symbolized the holiness of God, who declare them as being unsaved, as being unrepentant, and the fact is that their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, and they'll be cast into a lake of fire forever and ever. The Bible says, and death and hell be cast into the lake of fire forever and ever. They'll be raised up. That's the second resurrection. They'll be raised up. Every inhabitant of hell will be raised up, and they'll be cast with death itself into the lake of fire. That, the Bible says, is the second death. Listen, that is speaking about removal. Who are the ones that are left? The ones that are left are those who were faithful, those who were fervent, those who were focused. They'll be left to enter to the kingdom of Jesus Christ there. This is a kingdom removal. Before Christ establishes his kingdom, he will take out those who have not lived for him and those who did not accept him as Savior. There's the kingdom rule. There's the kingdom rumors. He's, some will say he's here, he's there. Listen not to them. Remember, his coming is sudden. His coming was preceded by his suffering. There's the kingdom responsibility. We're reminded about the days of Noah, the days of Lot. We're to be faithful. We're to be fervent. We're to be focused. We're reminded about a kingdom removal. As Jesus established his kingdom, there will be a removal of all those who did not trust in him. But there's one last thing. And to tie it all together, there's a kingdom requirement. And the kingdom requirement is that except a man be born again, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. There's only one way into the kingdom, and that's by a new birth. Not by physical birth. Not by good works. Not by church membership. Now, by baptism, there's only one way into the kingdom, and that's through the new birth, is when we realize we're born of the Spirit and by the Word of God. Jesus tells us you need to be saved to enter the kingdom of God. The new birth is repenting of your sins and by faith accepting Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. 
We invite you this morning, if you're not saved, we invite you today to open your heart and to be born again into God's family. It's not a rebirth physically. It's a new birth spiritually. It's a spiritual rebirth. It's understand today, except a man be born again, he cannot enter to the kingdom of God. Listen, if you don't get born again today, you cannot get into God's kingdom. You need to be born again. The Bible says, not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, by the working of regeneration, he says there, the work of regeneration means by the new birth. You're born anew into God's family. If you know Jesus Christ as your Savior, you've called on him by faith to save you. You've experienced a new birth. But if you've never repented of your sins and called him, he invites you this morning with a heart of mercy and a heart of love. We invite you today with a heart of mercy and a heart of love to trust Christ today, to receive him today as Savior so you can be born again into his family. Christian friend, we're called to live our lives in fervency, in faithfulness, and with focus. Will you do that today? Would you live for Christ? Maybe today you're someone you feel feeling like you're on a spiritual decline. The Lord can get you revived again. Maybe you're someone you've gotten out of focus. He can refocus you again. Whatever it may be today, why don't you find your place? You come out of your seat at the invitation. You find your way to the altar. Find your way to the seat. You say, Lord, I just, I just need more help this morning. I, I declare, I'm depend, I'm going to come to you today to be faithful focus, and fervent. And if you're this morning not saved, I invite you to come out of your seat, humble yourself, come meet one of our workers here at the, at the front of the aisle. We'll help you to come to know Jesus Christ, your Savior, so you can be saved. Let's bow our heads and close our eyes.